welcome back to more Warhammer lore. In today's video we will be delving into the Skaven as a society, their location, or locations I should say, their government, and a general societal overview. Now there is much to cover and for this reason I will be making not only a separate army video, but also a video on the four great clans and perhaps even more. There's plenty to cover, so let's get into it shall we? First things first, what exactly is a Skaven? They are simply Ratmen, also known as Ratkin or the Children of the Horned Rat. They are a malevolent and diabolical race of large humanoid rat creatures that inhabit a massive intercontinental underground empire known in their tongue simply as the Under Empire, where at the very heart of Skavendom lies the horrific city of Skaven Blight, the species capital city and the probable birthplace of the Skaven race. Skavens as a whole are a cruel, treacherous, and highly numerous species that have since spread their loathsome corruption to the farthest corners of the Warhammer world. From deep below the earth, these scavengers have built a vast empire whose military power and incomprehensible numbers has the potential to smother the kingdoms of the old world in a seething tide of violence and anarchy. It is believed by all of Skaven kind that the world is destined to be theirs, for they consider themselves the supreme master race, undeniably superior in every way to all the other races of the Warhammer world. The Skaven, in terms of physical appearance, look almost exactly like large bipedal rats, possessing just enough intelligence to make simple tools, converse in a developed language, and the more gifted among them are able to learn complex mathematics and rudimentary engineering. Skaven have an unexpected um, lifespan of about a handful of years or less. That said, were it not for the often violent internal competition of their species, they might live to be in their 20s, mid-20s-ish. More powerful members of Skaven society tend to live longer, even hundreds of years, due to the use of drugs, magic, or frequent use or exposure to the unstable magical substance known as warp stone. Now we will be touching on Warpstone later, but let's just say that Warpstone is essentially compressed chaos energy, much in the way a diamond is compressed coal, and it often comes with all the hazards of chaos energy such as mutation and possibly death from said mutations. Most Skaven have brown, often dirty or matted fur, with large fangs in the upper jaw structure, red bloodshot eyes, overgrown claws, and a naked tail growing to the size of its body's length. The large majority of Skaven are normally malnourished, having scrawny arms and legs, and lacking greatly in terms of strength or weight. Though physically weaker than most races, Skavens are naturally faster and more agile, and a natural digger. As such a Skaven can never truly go head to head with a human, but due to their cowardly nature they will more likely run than engage in direct conflict. Only when cornered will Skaven fight with a reckless sense of rage. And of note of that is that the, um, the Skaven, of course, seeing their main advantage being their speed, are highly uh, terrified of elves, because elves seem to be able to match them in agility. Um, not quite, it might go to the Skaven a little bit, but the elves have less of a problem with this than many of the other races. Those Skaven born as white and gray-furred are prized amongst Skaven litters, as they will often become gray seers, the Skaven equivalent of a priest and wizard in their society. Black fur is looked upon as the sign of a true killer, so the elite storm vermin corps draws their numbers from only those black furred ratlings. However, it is also common for light-colored Skaven to dye their fur black, especially if they happen to be a member of the storm vermin clans. Um, albino Skaven are rare, but are not unheard of and are considered special and unique in the eyes of Skavendom, and held in higher esteem than most other breeds. As such, those born as albino are often taken from birth and trained to become the elite of the elite, the personal storm vermin honor guard of the Council of Thirteen. Now these albinos are, do not have horns, that's what distinguishes them from the Grey Seers, and so that's how you can separate the two. If they have horns, they're going to be Grey Seers. If it's just an albino regular rat without horns, they're trained to be the elite version of Storm Vermin. Now we will be going into greater detail about the Council of Thirteen when we get into the Skaven government, and the Grey Seers also have a vital part in running of said government, but um, I guess running the government is not exactly the right word for it, but uh, you, you get the idea. A Skaven is roughly man-sized, with the typical specimen being between 4 and 5 feet tall on average. Their body posture is often hunched a trait that was developed from the cramped conditions of their natural habitat. Skaven fur is often fine and thick, 
making it excellent at insulating the body from the cold. The skin also excretes a layer of fine oil upon the fur that makes their bodies almost waterproof. This oil, which is common amongst aquatic rodents, contributes to the skaven being competent swimmers. The same oil is a pheromone that a skaven can use to deduce the emotions or motives of another individual. Certain pheromone smells can mean certain emotions that only a skaven knows can identify, such as fear, agitation, or stress. The skin of a skaven is thick, naturally thicker than a normal human, and its surface is often livered with a variety of scars. The most common are marks made by other skaven. Skaven also have naturally strong constitution against sickness and plagues, a trait that was forcibly developed in order to survive the often unsanitary environments that the majority of skaven live in. The skeletal structure of a skaven is also lightweight, giving them a greater degree of speed, movement, and natural reflexes than a typical human. This is further aided by possessing extremely strong back legs, which help to propel a skaven at twice the speed of a normal man. The skeleton itself is also highly flexible, enabling them to slide through even the most cramped environments with relative ease. However, due to their physiology, the typical skaven is often weaker in terms of physical strength in comparison to other intelligent races with the known, within the known world. So much so that a healthy human male can often easily outweigh and outmatch a skaven in terms of sheer physical strength alone. Also, the skaven advantage of movement and speed comes at the cost of a higher heartbeat and a high metabolic rate. In order to supply the body with sufficient energy, a typical skaven has to eat food far more frequently than what is considered normal by human standards. In fact, a typical skaven will naturally eat around five times a day, which usually amounts to eating its own body weight in total. This metabolism makes skaven naturally scrawny or even malnourished, forcing many skaven to eat just about anything, which also leads to frequent acts of cannibalism amongst their own kind. Like similar animals, nearly all skaven have acute hearing that allows them to hear sounds at a greater distance and range of frequency than humans. Skaven also have excellent noses, which can detect smells from a greater range than those of humans. Due to their subterranean lifestyle, a skaven has naturally poor eyesight during the daytime, but when in the darkness, most skaven can see in almost complete darkness with no need of light. Now, this high metabolic rate is also what is responsible for their very short lifespans because that's kind of how metabolic rates work. I won't go into sciencey stuff, but just get that the higher metabolic rate, the lower your total lifespan is going to be. It is of note that Skaven are in fact aware of most of their shortcomings, even though it goes against their nature to actually admit it, and have developed technology to aid um, their sight, as can be seen with Clan Squire engineers. They have like these goggles and telescopes and stuff like that. And um, they have developed also developed battle tactics to give them the greatest advantage in combat to compensate for their inadequacies. For instance, when fighting above ground, especially against races that have bad night eyes or rely on their sight too much, the Skaven will typically engage them in complete darkness at all costs, and when this can't be done, it is common for the Ratmen to start great raging pyres around the battlefield of their choosing, in which to blot out the sun and engulf both themselves and their enemies in the smoke. Though they don't need their eyes to know where you are, and so they consider the coughing and hacking of their own kind to be of no concern, and if they should accidentally kill one of their comrades, well, that's acceptable because as long as one enemy dies to every ten ratmen, they are probably trading up. Now, I would not blame you for believing that Skaven were some variant, stable mutation of beastmen. In fact, um, this does happen often in the Warhammer world. I mean, we have different varying races of beastmen that in fact were originally mutations from men that got spliced together with animals. Um, this isn't a Beastman video, so we won't go into too much detail. But um, you would be sadly mistaken if this is what you thought. In fact, the Skaven themselves have been using this subterfuge to trick their enemies into a false sense of security, as many of the Warhammer races don't believe that they exist at all. Which is something the Skaven have perpetuated through rumor and the occasional assassination of certain leaders, and always cover their tracks, and in fact, despite a previous war with the humans of the Empire, the current view of the Empire from their citizens is that the Skaven are a fairy tale that mothers tell their children to make them behave. If an Empire soldier literally ran into a Skaven, he would be more likely to think it a mutant human, or like I said previously, some kind of offshoot of beastmen. More examples of this will be covered in other videos, but needless to say, this is where you get the meme that Skaven don't exist, and it is in fact slightly more complicated than this, but uh, we will move on for now. 
So as a whole, the Skaven is at its base a very selfish and, a, and unloving creature. Raised within a turbulent society that only promotes violence, cunning, and the need for survival. As such, each and every Skaven has a mindset that it is singularly focused on survival, which offers little room for remorse or pity, not even for close quote-unquote friends, or even siblings or kin. Not only are the Skaven a petty and jealous race, they are also devious and sly in their attitude to one another. And kin means absolutely nothing, as often, um, for instance, the more bulkier Skaven are said to have eaten their kin <laughs> when they were first born, which also made them stronger, and that's how they ended up as big as they were. In their everyday lives, a Skaven is always looking for an angle to play in order to advance himself and only himself within the grander scheme of things. Naturally, a Skaven would usually find the quickest and easiest path to glory and power, a mindset that stems from the Skaven's extremely short lifespan, uh, lifespan that you've seen, uh, we've talked about before. This trait is most notable when a Skaven tries to claim an achievement as his own, which would naturally draw his attention and possible recognition amongst his peers, even though he probably had nothing to do with it. But perhaps the single most defining factor of a Skaven's mind is the emotion of fear. The only thing a Skaven truly has within the Under Empire is his own life, and to lose your life is the ultimate misery. However, the status of a Skaven within his society is also as important to a Skaven as his life, but perhaps only second to fear itself. To be shamed or demoted from a position of power is an extremely heavy blow to the overflattered ego of any Skaven, and to be humiliated publicly is even worse. Although this doesn't normally ensure the death of the Skaven that was humiliated, it nevertheless makes his life a living hell. This aspect of fear in Skaven society is so pronounced that over the generations the rat can have actually developed a fear gland that releases a musk around them in time of peril. This has also led to the expectation of those in higher standing to smell this musk on their underlings, and in fact it is custom that when your better approaches you, you should tilt your head and expose your throat in supplication to him, of course with a dash of musk, to truly allow him to believe that you fear him. More than one aspiring underling has been murdered for simply not venting their fear glands in the presence of a perhaps the skaven they planned on usurping. And perhaps some of them were not actually planning that, but either way it's a safe bet to simply vent the musk in the air regardless of true fear or not. And in fact it has been known that certain skaven, especially those in high standing, seem to have a bit of control over when and how much musk they allow to be smelled. Which, in Skaven society, where smells mean more than words, this is the equivalent of learning how to boldface lie, similarly to many politi politicians of our current world. For a Skaven, nothing ever seems to go the way he planned. If things had indeed, he might as well reign over a world covered in the bones of all the lesser races, with dozens of breeders at his feet, which is what they call their females. But fortunately for the world, such dreams of world dominance have always eluded even the greatest of their kind due to the actions of the upstart inferior races. In the eyes of a Skaven, the inferior races are the true vermin of the world, living out their lives and defying the one true superior race that truly dominates them all. They are filled with a fierce hatred against them and have always burned with the desire to show them their place they truly deserve, which is often death or digestion in their stomachs. Being a victim of their attacks is an insult in itself, and even in their last gasps, any Skaven would express their last few words of hatred towards these vermin. Of course, when things go wrong, this is not always the fault of the lower races. Most of the time, Skaven would blame their own kind for the setbacks their race has gone through. After all, for a Skaven, if something goes wrong, it cannot be his fault, because he is the greatest of all the Skaven. The only possible explanation is that one of his superiors, or his subordinates, is plotting to work against him. Any setback is therefore likely to result in a long and insane paranoia that another Skaven from somewhere, some place in the Under Empire, is plotting against him. If a warband is routed, it is obviously because of the cowardice of the clan rats or the lack of conviction of his officers. If an entire horde is lost, it is necessarily the fault of the Lords of Decay who provided him with such incompetent minions. If it rains too much, if the well is dry, if it's too hot or too cold, the faults shall lie always with the Grey Seers who meddle in what they should not. No matter what situation, no matter what the results, Skaven will never recognize fault in his own actions. Ever. To 
to a Skaven, life is a complex web of plots and intrigues, designed by his enemies for the sole purpose of harming him and only him. A cautious Skaven, however, never attracts more attention than is necessary, for fear of becoming a tempting target for an upstart underling or suspicious superior. It is common for Saint Skaven to show their superiority towards their underlings by showering them with shrill abuse on a regular basis. These actions are as much as to inflate a Skaven's ego as to deter potential rivals. Thus, while the failures of a Skaven are due to the weakness of the machinations of others, their achievements are nevertheless the result of his own incredible talents. To a Skaven, if a group assault decimates the enemy, it would be thanks to his brilliant planning. If a Skaven horde emerges in the right place, it is thanks to his genius that they have discovered the right path. Whether it's the right time, the right place, or the perfect weather, a Skaven should always believe that he is a master of strategy, logistics, and politics beyond anyone else in the entire Under Empire. This is easily the most recognized trait in the great Greyseer Thankful, which if you know about Warhammer Fantasy, you probably know who he is. He is the epitome of Skaven psychology, and he has in fact lost entire armies of Skaven at his command, but it just never seems to be his fault. On the flip side of that coin, every minor and indeed major victory that usually had nothing to do with the Grey Seer is indeed a stroke of his genius. If you ever get a chance to read any of these novels, I will recommend at the time um, any of the Thankful series, any book that he's in. He's an excellent character, very rich and deep in the lore. And he's probably one of the reasons why I've got so into the Skaven in general. But that's enough about me. Let's get back to the Underfolk. So we will be moving on to the origins of the Skaven as a race, which is kind of complicated. The only source of origin scholars could gather about the first existence of the Skaven was mentioned in an old Telean tale called the Doom of Kavzar. The version most commonly referenced by scholars is an ancient epic poem of 13 stanzas, and either the original Tilian or a translation. Copies of this tale have all been destroyed or have since gone missing over the course of the centuries. Some speculate that imperial authorities accused the text of being heretical and burned all the knowledge it held. Others believe that the Skaven might even have had a hand in this disappearance. The tale, however, lives on within the lands of Tilia, as the story is very common folklore amongst the many farmers and commoners that live in the rolling countryside of that land. Indeed, the Tilians of that land are far more closer with these vermins than many would care to admit, and this old story was once foretold by their grandfathers' grandfathers from ages long ago, a time when one of mankind's cities was truly at its most pinnacle. And now I'm actually going to read the poem in all its stanzas, so forgive me if it uh, sounds a little um, poetic because it's a poem. Uh, Once upon a time, long, long ago, men and dwarfs lived together beneath the roof of one great city. Some said it was the oldest and greatest city in the world and had existed before the time of the Longbeards and Manlings, built by older and wiser hands in the dawn of the world. The city lay both above and below the earth, in keeping with the nature of the populace that dwelt there. The dwarfs ruled in their great halls of stone below ground, and wrestled the fruits of the, f- of the rock free with their day-long toil, while the manlings reaped the fields of swaying corn that surrounded the city with a patchwork blanket of gold. The sun smiled, men laughed, and everyone was happy. One day, the men of the city decided that they should give praise to their gods for their good fortunes. They planned a temple such as the world had never seen before. In the central square, a colossal hall would be built and topped with a single, cloud-piercing tower, a tower so tall it would touch the very heart of the heavens. After much planning and with the help of the Longbeards, they set about their monumental task. Weeks became months, and months became years, and still the manlings built. Men grew old and gray working on that great temple, their sons continuing their work through summer, sun, and winter rain. At last, after many generations, work began on the great spire itself. Years passed, and the tower reached such a height that the manlings found it ever more difficult to take the stone up to the top. Eventually, the work slowed to a crawl, and finishing the tower seemed impossible. Then one came amongst the men of the city who offered his help in this great scheme. He asked a single boon of them in return, and claimed that if they would grant him this, he would complete the tower in a single night. The manlings said to themselves, What have we to lose? And offered to make a bargain with the gray-clad stranger. All he wished was to add his own dedication to the gods under under the temple structure. The manlings agreed and the bargain was struck. At dusk the stranger entered 
the unfinished temple and bade the Manlings to return at midnight. Clouds swept over the moons, cloaking the temple in darkness as the Manlings left. All over the city, men watched and waited as the hours slipped past, until near midnight, by ones and twos, they gathered in the temple square. The wind blew, and the clouds parted as they gazed up at the temple. It rose like an unbroken lance against the sky, pure and white. At its very peak, a great horned bell, huge, gleaming cloudly in the moonlight. The stranger's dedication to the gods was there, but of the stranger himself, there was no sign. The manlings rejoiced that their father's father's work was done. They surged forward to enter the temple. Then at the stroke of midnight, the great bell began to toll. Once. Twice. Thrice. Slow, heavy waves of sound rolled across the city. Four. Five. Six times the bell rang, like the torpid pulse of a bronze giant. Seven. Eight. Nine. The rolling of the bell grew louder with each ring, and the manling staggered back from the temple, still clutching their ears. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. At the thirteenth stroke, lightning split the skies and thunder echoed through the night. High above, the dark circle of Morsleb was lit by a bright flash, and all fell ominously silent. The manlings fled to their beds, frightened and puzzled by the portents they had seen. The next morning, they, ar they arose to find that the darkness had come to their city. Brooding storm clouds reared above the rooftops, and such rain fell as had never been seen before. Black like ash, the rain fell and puddled in the streets, slicking the cobbles with darkly irresistant colors. At first, some of the manlies didn't worry. They waited for the rain to stop so that they might resume their work. But the rain did not stop. The winds blew stronger, and lightning shook the high tower. Days stretched into weeks, and still the rain did not stop. Each night the bell tolled thirteen times, and each morning the darkness lay across the city. The manlings became fearful and prayed to their gods. Still the rains did not stop, and the black clouds hung like a shroud over the fields of flattened corn. The manlings went to the dwarfs and beseeched their help. The long beards were unconcerned. What mattered a little rain on the surface? In the bosom of the earth all was warm and dry. Now the manlings huddled in their dwellings fear gnawing at their hearts. They sent some of their number to faraway places to seek help, but none of them returned. Some went to the temple to pray and sacrifice their dwindling food to the gods, but they found the temple doors were closed to them. The rain grew heavier. Dark hailstones fell from the sky and crushed the sodden crops. The great bell tolled a death knell over the terrified city. Soon great stones cleft the heavens, rushing down like dark meteors to smash the homes of the manlings. Many sickened and died from no apparent cause, and the newborn babies of the manlings were hideously twisted. Skulking vermin devoured what little stored corn was left, and the manlings began to starve. The manly elders went to see the dwarfs again, and this time demanded their help. They wanted to bring their folk below ground to safety. They wanted food. The longbeards grew angry, and told the manlings that the lower workings were flooded, and their food had also been devoured by rats. They remained barely enough food and shelter for them and their kinsmen. They cast the manlings out of their halls and closed their doors once more. In the ruins of the city above, each day became more deadly than the last. The manlings despaired and called for succor from the dark gods, whispered the names of forgotten demon princes in the hopes of salvation, but none came. Instead, the vermin returned, bigger and bolder than ever. Their slinking furred shapes infested the broken city, feasting on the fallen and pulling down the weak. Each midnight the bell tolled thirteen times on high, seeming now brazen and triumphant. The manlings lived as hunted creatures in their own city, as great rat packs roamed the streets in search of them. At last, the desperate manlings took up such weapons as they had and beat down the dwarf's door, threatening that if they did not emerge they would drag them out by their beards. No reply came from within. The manlings took up beams and battered down the door to reveal the tunnels below, dark and empty. Stealing themselves, the pitiful remnants of the city's once proud populace descended. In the ancient hall of kinship, they found the dwarfs, now naught but gnawed bones and scrapes of cloth. And there they saw by the dying light of their torches the myriad eyes about them, glittering like liquid midnight as the rats closed in for the kill. The manlings stood back to back and fought for their lives. But against such implacable ferocity, the countless numbers of the verminous horde, their weapons were useless. The tide of monstrous rats flowed over them one by one, dragging them down to be torn apart. 
the yellow chisel teeth sinking into their soft flesh, the dark tufted mass drowning their pitiful screams with their hideous chittering. And that was the Doom of Kevzar. In many ways this story mirrors our own story of the Tower of Babylon, and indeed there are many similarities present. It is thought that this mysterious stranger who finished the tower is indeed possibly the Horned Rat, but since the Skaven may have not existed until after the culmination of the bell, I believe that another Chaos Deity is at work here. The stranger has all the telltale signs of Zinch, the Changer of Ways, and in fact the Skaven as a race could be a product of some long convoluted plan he set into motion. Of course, with all things Zinch takes part in, it is possible that either his plan was simply to punish the humans at the cost of the vermin, as often he enjoys turning situations on their head, but perhaps he didn't plan on what the Skaven would become, bringing the Horned Rat into existence. But then again, maybe all these things were a part of the Lord of Change's great plan. No one will ever know. You will have also noticed by now that I haven't delved into where the Skaven are centrally located. And that is simply because the Skaven are in fact everywhere in the Warhammer world. They make their greatest holdings beneath the large cities of what they consider the lesser races, and often are involved in essentially a guerrilla war with the city above. They are Skaven as far as the eastern lands of in Cathay and Dupont, just as there are Skaven in Lustria and all throughout the Old World. There are even holds beneath the Chaos Wastes, the most famous being the Hell Pit, the home of Clan Mulder. So far the only places the Skaven have been held out of is Athel Lorin and Othwan. This is not to say that the Skaven have not tried to invade these places, because they have, but they can't seem to get a foothold in these lands, uh, mostly because of the elves, but also because of the magical nature of the land itself. In the case of Ulthuan, the entire island is suspended above the ocean floor and is held in place with magic, and so the Skaven cannot dig a tunnel to make a city underneath said island, forcing them instead to sail their ramshackle vessels to the island, which has led to catastrophic losses in the past. In the case of Athel Lorin, the great forest roots have been known to collapse any tunnels made beneath them and bind and choke any ratkin found in said tunnels. This has led the Skaven for the most part to fear elven kind over all of the other lesser species, as they seem capable to match the Skaven in speed and cunning, as I said earlier. But it is also of note that the Dark Elves are one of the few races that not only know about the Skaven openly, but also have an almost um, shaky, I'd say, trade agreement with them for slaves, and, and they give the Skaven Warpstone for said slaves. Of course, they both constantly betray one another, but those are probably minor details in the eyes of both races. The Skaven primarily use a system of tunnels on the surface to travel between their cities, though many of these tunnels seem to be flooded or underground lakes or rivers, and so barges are a common means of locomotion, and also a valued profession within the Under Empire. They have also taken over a great portion of the Dwarven Underway, and use these passages to both harry the dwarfs, and is a more secure route when traveling, as the Skaven built tunnels are prone to collapse, and are often never properly braced by the Ratkin, whom find it not worth their time, as they will most likely not be the ones squished in the inevitable cave-in. Now we're going to cover some of the um, ground we've already covered with the new Skaven caste systems, but Skaven society is often divided between two types of social system, which is separated between a caste system and a clan hierarchy. The caste system focuses heavily upon the color of a Skaven's fur, which denotes the Skaven as being assigned to a, a particular role in society. Those born with gray and white fur are considered chosen of the horned rat and thusly are presented as the priest or religious caste of the Under Empire. If they don't have horns, they are considered the albino Sturmvarman, the elite guard of the Council of Thirteen, which we covered earlier. Below the priest class are the militaristic warrior caste, that are composed almost exclusively of black fur Skaven. Black fur is considered the mark of a killer, and Skaven of that color are therefore given a position in society that focuses heavily on training these individuals into hardened warriors. In certain cases, a Skaven who does not possess black fur can still join if he can prove to be just as effective a warrior as any other black fur Skaven. Such situations nevertheless ensure that the Skaven would at least dye their fur black as to keep to their image as an elite warrior. Below the warrior class is the um, general population, which are brown fur Skaven. 
the brown furred skaven formed the very foundations of Skane society, making them the most diverse in terms of profession, quality of life, and social status. Being outside the caste system, the brown furred skaven are often divided further into certain sects that focus on professions such as trading, building, and the crafting of weapons and goods. All of these groupings allow the Skaven to apply their urge for social climbing on a much larger scale, each sect battling for supremacy over the other, just as each Skaven battled for supremacy within his sect. Outright warfare between these groups is not as common as many would think, simply because the priest class often moderates hostilities between factions by use of terror and cruelty and telling them that the Horned Rat will eat them if they uh, don't do as they're told. In their case, the priest caste wants to ensure full control over the Under Empire, and without some form of unity, the Under Empire as a whole would not exist. Outside of the caste system, Skaven society is usually dominated by a treacherous clan-based hierarchy, from which clans of warlords make up the bulk of the ever-growing population of male ratmen. These militaristic clans, known as warlord clans, form a hierarchy defined by the law of the strongest ruling over the weakest. At the top of this hierarchy is the warlord, hence its name, who is supposed to be the strongest and most cunning individual within the entire clan. These warlords are the official and tyrannical rulers of the Skaven clans, whose rule is both harsh and absolute. Below the warlord is also the warrior caste, which as expected is composed of Blackford Skaven trained as elite warriors as befit their prestigious position. The Skaven are given the best the clan has to offer, which often includes adequate and regular meals, his own personal lodging, the best weapons and armors, and the rights to breed with the clan's female Skaven, known simply as breeders or broodmothers. At the base of this pyramid hierarchy is the foundation of which all society is built around, the working class, the insignificant and expendable slaves, or workers as the Skaven like to call them. Slaves and workers can be of varying races or culture, and often are prisoners of war or members of a rival clan that have since been subjugated into submission. Within this harsh reality, the concept of life and individual freedom are next to worthless within clan society. Survival is considered paramount to the individual, and so is the ascension of social status. Although they rarely admit it, nearly all Skaven view all clanmates as potential enemies. Skaven who occupy positions of power or authority are envied for their power, while those ratmen who serve in lesser roles are constantly suspected of treachery. The daily clan life of a Skaven is often marked by continuous fights and power struggles for supremacy. A Skaven's life is as lawless and miserable where the weak are killed and the strong survive, provided they constantly watch their backs against rivals. Amongst their kind, backstabbing and betrayals are not considered dishonorable behavior, but simply the most traditional way to advance in society. As a result, this unstable system has given rise to extremely high levels of paranoia by nearly all Skaven leaders within all levels of society. All Skaven know their status within the clan, but the positions between them can change rapidly. A few rapid betrayals or even a single well-given stab in the back can convert a lowly soldier in the position of paw leader even before the body of his victim is dropped. In the same vein, it can be said that a Skaven warlord or chieftain will always and forever only be a stab away from his subordinates. Everyday life at all levels of Skaven society is marked by this constant pushing and nudging. In relations of power, as each individual is conspiring day and night to improve their own personal reputation and status, or undermining others amongst his group, alliances are created, broken and then reformed constantly as consequences. There's not even equality between individuals of the same social status, as there will always be someone in the group who, who is considered ahead of the others. Each Skaven scrutinizes all other pack members within the group, looking for any weakness that can be used against them, and as a result would often be scrutinized by the former as well. At all levels of the pyramid, but especially in the lower classes, the power struggle often takes the form of direct physical confrontation. Most Skaven suffer terrible scars from these battles, and many often lose an eye or an ear as a mark of the brutality. A crippled Skaven resulting in one of these confrontations usually won't last long, and will eventually be eaten by the more desperate of their kind. If the, if the loser does not get killed instantly, the cheering mass will pounce on him to disembowel him and devour him in his weakened state. In the Skaven's case, a crippled clansman is simply a liability and will be eaten for food. All clans constantly fluctuate in the numbers of members they currently have. This stems mostly from the fact that Skaven population numbers often increase exponentially during times when food is plentiful, and comes down drastically during times of starvation. 
At its greatest extent, Erwolord Skaven has the power and influence to control a clan with around a hundred or even tens of thousands of individuals, spread across many dens and underground burrows all across the occupied territories. The exact number of the different clans that are scattered throughout the Under Empire is near uncountable, due to the fact that the rival clans will constantly conquer or perhaps even destroy each other in often short amounts of time. Possible numbers for a single clan might be around the tens of thousands, but the precise number changes almost daily, as the largest and most powerful warlord clans will pursue and destroy the minor clans, absorbing its members as warriors or slaves, or simply devouring and feasting on the survivors. Clans growing too fast or too slow will eventually lead to internal rivalries, for which would be the result of the warlord not exerting enough authority to, on his subordinates which would eventually lead to a small-scale civil war between these smaller factions within the clan. Now, there are innumerable amounts of clans, which often have a niche they fill in Skaven society, ranging from slavemanship to fleet masters to battle with particular um, lesser races and so on. Of these many clans, there are four great clans. There is Clan Mulder, famous for breeding and creating beasts of war and beasts of burden. They are the creators of the Rat Ogres and the Hellpit Abomination. Then there is Clan Scryer, who creates the various siege engines and advances the Skaven race in forms of technology through a bizarre blend of techno-sorcery and science. They are the reasons that the Skaven are amongst the most advanced civilization of the Warhammer world when it comes to weapons of war, with them having developed the powerful Rattling Gun, the Warp Fire Thrower, and Poison Globes, as well as Gas Masks to protect themselves from said Poison Globes. The next great clan is Pestilence, the home of the zealot disease followers of the Horned Rat. Indeed, Pestilence is feared by both its enemies and allies alike, for this clan has particularly been responsible for several large-scale civil wars of the Under Empire, and have come close to toppling the Council of Thirteen, and not for the arrival of the last great clan. Clan Eshin are the Guild of Assassins and Cutthroats. They specialize in stealth, murder, poison, and the trafficking of information, an essential piece in the ruling of the Under Empire. Now, I will be going into greater detail on these clans on their own dedicated videos, and so now we will just move on to the Council of Thirteen. The Council of Thirteen is the ruling body of the Skavens under Empire, and whose members are now famously throughout the uh, Skaven lands as the Lords of Decay. These Rat Lords of the Skaven race oversee all matters pertaining to the entire species, from hatching terrible plots to initiating an invasion against the enemies of their kind. Within the tyr tyrannical hierarchy of the Ender Empire, the Council of Thirteen consists of Warlords of the four great clans, as well as seven other lesser Warlords. It is considered the right and sovereign duty of the Council of Thirteen to unite the various greater and lesser clans under a single banner. While the Council holds sway over the entirety of the Under Empire, the reality of a unified Skaven nation has yet to be fully realized, uh, with the exception of the End Times, but we're not going into that. If it were not for the constant squabbling between the various Skaven clans, the Great Ascendancy would have occurred millennium ago. Instead, there's been nothing but fighting and bickering between the Skaven, much to the benefit of the Old World. Within the capital city of Skavenblight, the Lords of Decay sit at a long horseshoe table made of pure warp stone and engraved with one of the many of the Horned Rat's commandments. Seats 1 through 12 are seated such that they are the most extreme numbers, such as 1 and 12 are highly held by the higher ranking members of the council, while the middle seat, such as 6 and 7, are held by the lowest ranking members. Seat 13 is the symbolic seat of the Horned Rat, and it acts as a tiebreaker in votes amongst the other members, with the Horned Rat's vote typically being interpreted by one of the Grey Seers, often from the Seer Lord himself. This effectively gives the Grey Seers an extra vote, as they also hold the first seat. The Council of Thirteen gathers in whole or in part at least once a month, and sessions are occasionally called on a weekly basis, especially in times of war. The council members discuss battle plans, political dilemmas, and important issues that face their race and must involve on the, what course of action needs to be taken. Politics also play an important part in the council's discussions, and alliances are often made or broken in full view of the other members. The unity of the council remains at its core an illusion. Only when the issue is most dire, or when the Horned Rat himself personally intervenes in the decision making, will the council ever unite under a single cause. 
Now, it is of note that before the Council of Thirteen was founded, a council of Grey Seers was the former rulers of the Under Empire. Now, the Horned Rat is at its as at the core of Skaven society, and all Skaven are said to have to worship him and do so in many ways. Blood sacrifice is common in the day-to-day -day worship of the Horned Rat. The Skaven fear that if the Horned Rat's appetite is not satisfied, he will devour children instead. The form of the sacrifices, uh, a slave, Skaven, or otherwise, is not as important as the sacrifice itself. There is no specific doctrine that governs who or what must be sacrificed. The sacrifice itself is enough to sate the Lord of Decay for a brief time. Young victims are considered to be more potent sacrifices, while the blood of the aged or the sickly is less desirable. The number of sacrifices made to the Horned Rat by his followers varies considerably depending upon their need. In times of war, the number of daily blood sacrifices can be staggering, sometimes numbering in the thousands in the greater Skaven cities of Skaven Blight or Hell Pit. The Skaven also increase the number of daily sacrifices if they fail to secure victory in battle, or suffer some other embarrassing setback. The Grey Seers preach that victory cannot be won if the Horned Rat is unsatisfied with his minions and thus, any defeat or failure is a sign that he must be appeased. Religious services are constantly held by the Grey Seers in honor of their sinister god. All Skaven are expected to be present at Mass at least once a day, even though no formal record of attendance is kept. Those who do not attend services open themselves up to all manner of criticism, including accusations of heresy, treason, and atheism. Influential Skaven warlords contract their own spiritual advisors from the ranks of the Grey Seers, and these priests for hire give private services to their employers and their households. It is also for this reason that members of Clan Pestilence are seen as heretics by the Grey Seers, as not only do they not attend Mass, and often attempt to recruit other various lesser clans into their cult of decay, and seem to be able to utilize sorcery. Something that the Grey Seers take great offense to, and they should be the only chosen allowed to wield the power of their god. Of course, all Skaven don't necessarily worship the Horned Rat, but they also make a point of at least pretending to, as it will not open themselves up to possible retaliation at the hands of their many enemies in the Under Empire. And that was kind of a brief segue into the religion slash way the Grey Seers help govern the Skaven. Now we will move on to the Skaven language. The language of the Ratmen is queakish. It is a chittering and hasty, and hasty speech. Skaven dialogue is often littered with the hodgepodge of rapid squeaks and trills. Queakish words are short, clipped, and often repeated several times in a row in an effort to add emphasis to certain statements. Due to the speed with which queakish is spoken, long sentences are often broken up into several fragments. As such, these fragmented sentences must be pieced together to form coherent thoughts, especially during long stretches of dialogue. The written form of queakish consists of several thousand pictograms, each representing a single word or concept. Most Skaven know the most important pictograms, while only a few can recite them all. As new discoveries are made, new pictograms are revised. Many are so similar as to be indistinguishable to the untrained eye. Writing is accomplished by the use of a sharpened stylus or an extended claw. Now only the highest ranking members of society can in fact read and write, so many merchants and peddlers will instead of making a sign written in Queekish, a scrawling that few can read, will utilize a rag or cloth of some sort covered in their scent and also of what they are selling. For instance, a slave trader would leave his musk and that of his slaves, be they human, goblin, or other skaven, on his desired cloth with a crude arrow pointing in the direction from a central junction point of uh, where his stand will be set up. It is in fact a testament to the smell and capabilities of the skaven that even in vast markets like those of Skaven Blight or Under Altdorf, that they can in fact discern from these scents each individual skaven. And now we will move into Skaven economy. The basic economic system of the Skaven is extremely simple. The strongest take everything they want. Whenever a plunder is taken, the warlords, chieftains, or sorcerer, who directs the raiding force, takes what they choose first. Then the other warriors will pick what they want or leave them be. The food, however, is distributed a little more evenly. The most powerful clan warriors have the best weapons and food, plus the ability to have their own den, 
uh, in the clan and mate to create their own litters. The exchange of large quantities of arms and slaves between different clans is very common. However, if there's really a form of currency within the Skaven's economic system, it would most likely be the distribution and use of warp stone. Also called witch stone or word stone, this material is used for any public or private commercial activity within a clan in small amounts, complementing the basic economy system that is needed to run the clan functionally. In larger quantities, this material is often exchanged between other clans for food, slaves, weapons, or to hire out mercenary forces for their wars. It is also valuable when close diplomatic and political dealings are made between chieftains or political leaders. This exchange is often in the form of warp tokens, which are made from warp stone. If a Skaven with a considerable wealth and talent at bartering wishes, he may create and own a small shop, containing goods that either he or his clan have bred, grown, or created for the purpose of selling to the highest bidder. Most of these shops follow a very competitive and dangerous monopoly. Just like the Skaven and their clans, each shop will try their best to outdo the competition destroying, assassinating, or even subduing rivals in the hopes of gaining more profit and influence within the proximity of their store. A good majority of these shops are owned and administered by one of the two great clans, such as Clan Mulder or Clan Scryer. These clan owned shops sell goods that the clan specializes in creating, such as weapons and war beasts that are always in high demand. Although owned by the clan, the owners of these shops do not always have to be a member of the clan, but rather a simple skaven gifted at the skills of bartering. These shopkeepers can sometimes be entirely independent, with some buying the goods from the clans for a cheap price and then selling them at a higher value to other gullible skaven customers. As such, some are considerably wealthy and well fed, often sporting large guts as a sign of their wealth. It is also of note that in the upcoming Total War Warhammer title, the Skaven have a unique resource they must manage being food, which after going through all of this, it is simply perfect. As you can see, food is an essential part of Skaven society, almost as important as the Horned Rat himself, or even Warpstone. And with that, I will be closing out this Skaven Society and Origins video. I will be doing more videos on the Skaven, particularly their army and fighting tactics, as well as videos for each great clan and of course the legendary lores included in the upcoming title. The Ratkin are one of, if not, my favorite races in Warhammer, and hopefully you will grow to love them as I do. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. It does help the channel grow and allows more people to see these videos. I appreciate all you guys that are currently subscribed and viewing the content, but if you're new, Make sure to do this, it will help others see it as well. Now, I also might have missed some information here, and hopefully I will cover it in some of my later videos, but don't be afraid to leave it down in the comment section as if it pertains to what we're covering right now, if not the army roster or whatnot, because that will be covered later. But if I miss something, leave it in the comments so that everybody can see it. Then hopefully I will either be able to pick it up in a later video or um, just leave it there and then people will be able to see your comment and see how much smarter you are than me. <laughs> Not a hard thing to do, actually. But um, I really enjoy making these videos for you guys and I hope to keep doing them for you. As long as people are watching, I'll keep making them. And with that, I have been Jumbo Thick. Thanks for watching and have a good day.